I'm told when you smile at people, they smile back. <laughs> Come on, are you, are you smiling? Most of you are. Congratulations, that's awesome. Hey, uh, how many of you are a parent? Put up your hand if you're a parent. Okay, how many of you know somebody and you were kind of around and you got to meet, uh, whether it's a family member, a friend, a coworker, and they had a baby and you were kind of around in their life at that time? Put up your hand if, if you knew somebody who had a, had a baby. Yeah, pretty incredible. And so if you're a parent, uh, do you remember... Do you remember how you felt, what was going on in your head and your heart when you first met your child? And if you're not a parent, do you remember what went on in your head and heart when you first met your friend or your family member's child when they first came into the world? How did you feel? What was going on in your head? What were you thinking? Do you remember the thoughts that, that, that came into your head? There are moments in life when certain thoughts get seared into our brains. And a moment like that often is remembered for life. Well, I asked a few people who are parents. Most of them were younger parents. They wouldn't have to remember so far back. But I asked them this question, how did you feel? What were you thinking when you first met you're a child and welcome them to the world. Now, I have some stock pictures, but the answers are from people in our church. So here's the first one. It was awe, like seeing the Grand Canyon. Amazing. Amazing. Next. She was really, really, <laughs> I love this, really real, uncontrollable, unstoppable, sobbing, the moment I saw her. Maybe some of you can relate. Next. I was over. Uh, it was the most perfect and indescribable feeling. There are no words that even exist to describe that miraculous moment of first meeting her. How many of you are remembering back to when you first met that special person? Yeah, absolutely. It's, that's an emotional thing. Next slide. I was overwhelmed as tears of joy rolled down my face. It felt as if time had stood still, and in that moment, we became a family. Amazing. Now, I had long conversations with these people, and I, and I just took little snippets of what they shared. This wasn't everything that they shared. There's a lot to say about meeting somebody for the first time and welcoming them to this world and everything that's going on in your heart and mind. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. This person said, I was just so happy she was a girl. <laughs> so full disclosure, that was my wife. <laughs> she said that. Uh, we did not find out if we were having a boy or a girl with our first child. And I, I highly recommend it. So exciting. So exciting. And uh, so my wife grew up just with sisters. She was deathly afraid of having a boy. She didn't know what to do with boys. And uh, so she was pretty excited to have uh, a girl. But there's so much joy bringing a human into the world and everything around it. It's just incredible. Um, I remember crying for three days, and I'm not much of a crier, when my firstborn was born, and um, my second and third, I was crying for different reasons. But um, <laughs> I cried for about three days, and I was just in awe. And I remember leaving the hospital. I felt like I stole a baby because <laughs> I didn't go out. I didn't go in with this thing. <laughs> and we came out with this uh, child. But it was an amazing uh, experience. Hey, turn to John chapter 16. Turn to John chapter 16. Open your Bible app. Uh, scroll to John chapter 16. And we are uh, going to be starting in verse 16 this morning of John uh, chapter 16. So Jesus, he's in his final moments before his betrayal and his arrest. He just told his uh, original disciples uh, about the power of the Holy Spirit to convict the world in three different areas. If you were here last week, you'll remember this. What were those three areas that the Holy Spirit would convict the world in? Number one was, yeah, you got it. Nobody got it. Um, let me give you a hint. It starts with S and ends with N. Oh, good, good. Okay, sin and righteousness, good. And number three, judgment. judgment. Well done. And if you miss that, 
guess what? You're subscribed to our YouTube channel, and you can catch up, because it's really powerful, powerful scripture passage on the, the Holy Spirit and his work and his power and how Jesus went away. Jesus, who uh, limited himself to becoming a form of a servant, but when he went away, he came back basically uh, in unlimited form. Now, I'm getting into all sort of theological deep weeds here, but the bottom line is, is that the Holy Spirit is powerful, and you need to check out that sermon. Now, Jesus, uh, in our passage, he uses uh, four different negative words four times in this passage. He uses one word four times and then three other unique words to make his point, and he uses the word sorrow. Everybody say sorrow. He uses that word four times, and then he uses uh, the words weep, lament, and anguish, because he's trying to get across the emotion of going through the valley in life. Now, sorrow, it literally means sadness, uh, grief, or heaviness, and so some of you may be in the throes of that heaviness, of feeling that weight of sorrow on your shoulders right now, and maybe it's something going on at work, and it's it's heavy, and it's just grinding away at you, and it's staying on your shoulders, and you're anxious about it, you're worried about it, and you're in sorrow, and and maybe it's something to do with at home, maybe your spouse is, is causing sorrow, or maybe you think they're causing sorrow, but it's really coming from you, but you'll find out one day soon. But the bottom line is you feel this weight going on in your, in your marriage at, at home or maybe with your kids and, and you're feeling weighed down at work, you're feeling weighed down at home. Uh, maybe it's health. Maybe there's something going on that's unknown and you've been to the dock and, you, and you've gone back and you're still trying to figure it out and, and it's just annoying and it's just, it's still with you. It's, it's not being resolved and it's, it's weighing you down and it's driving you, you crazy. Or maybe some of you, You've gone through a death in the family. Maybe it it was even years ago, but you're still feeling the weight of anguish. You're still feeling the weight of grief and and, and missing that person in your life and and how full it was when they were around. And and, and you've got all these bricks of of heaviness and weight and sorrow, and it's, 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 it's absolutely driving you crazy. And you carry this with you. And some of us do carry this with us. Some of you are carrying this right now. And, and I don't know about you, but you know what I do with my way to sorrow sometimes? I do this. I hold on to it tight. I don't want to let it go. Have you ever been there? You just want to hold on to your, your sadness and your grief, maybe your bitterness, your frustration. And you just keep that weight with you, and you wonder why you're so exhausted, and every morning you wake up, and you're wondering, man, why is it such a drag to get out of bed? But here's the thing we know about sorrow. It's going to come. It's going to come in your heart. It's going to come in your mind. It's going to come into your life. You can't stop it, and there's no recourse. It's coming your way. You're either in sorrow, or you're about to go in sorrow. It's just kind of the reality of life, and it's hard to deal with. And when your sorrow hour comes, it's like time slows down. Do you ever watch those movies, and you see the, the second hand go tick, 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 tick? And that's what life feels like when you're weighed down. And, and, and I'm weighed down, right? my shoulder's hurting right now, um, and I can't wait to get this off. But, but that's how you feel when you carry a bag of bricks of weighty sorrow around with you. But here's what you shouldn't do. Don't worship your sorrow. Don't worship it. I know it's on your heart and mind, but try not to let it take over your life so much that it looks like you're bowing down at the altar of sorrow and worshiping your sorrow. Don't let it stop you from moving forward. Keep engaging with life. Keep engaging with Jesus. Keep moving forward. Lift your head. You're going to get through it. And, and in a little while, um, you won't have the right perspective in sorrow. That's why you need to lean on other people and ask them, can you help carry my sorrow? Can you do that now? Can you just turn to your neighbor and ask, ask them now? It's good to practice for even if you're not in sorrow. Say, can you help me with my sorrow? Turn to your neighbor, ask them. Don't be shy. I know I annoy you guys asking you to talk to your neighbor, but it wakes you up. It keeps you with me, and this is important what God wants to say to you today. And even within your sorrow... Give thanks to God. Can we say that? Say, thank you, God. Say it again. Thank you, God. 
and, and talk to him. Keep your prayer life active. Turn to him. Turn back to him. Even if you can't pray in your sorrow, because sometimes it's hard to pray when, when, when the weight is so heavy. And there's going to be a moment where you're going to say, God, help me in my unbelief. I don't feel like talking to you right now. I can't talk to you right now. And you know what's going to happen? I don't know if you've ever read Philippians 4, 6, 7. But there's going to be a moment, it's not going to make sense, even in the middle of your sorrow, where the peace of God which transcends all understanding is going to help you drop, and you're going to feel light. And it's not because your circumstance changed. It's not because the pain isn't real and raw. But it's because of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Amen? And don't stop engaging with the Lord. Don't stop engaging with life. And don't make ultimatums. Well, I'm never, I will never, there's no way I'll ever do, don't say those statements. Trust the Lord. He's going to give you peace. Let's look at our passage this morning, starting in verse 16. It says, a little while, this is Jesus talking to his original disciples, uh, his original students who followed him for three years. A little while, you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. That sounds a little strange, Jesus. But he, he explains it a bit, and I'll explain it more. Verse 17, so some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me? I mean, he's repeated that, those, those phrases have been repeated three times. It's an important phrase to remember. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, everybody say truly, truly. If you see truly, truly, you truly have to pay attention. Jesus is making an incredible weighty point that's important. You don't want to miss. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will what? You will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. The world will rejoice because the world has no interest in God. When he's talking about the world, he's talking about the, the people in the world who, who don't want anything to do with God. And they're excited that Jesus, the Son of God, will be strung up on a Roman cross and they will rejoice. But you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Everybody say joy. joy. This is Jesus saying, truly, truly pay attention. Listen to this. Don't miss this. Burn this into your heart. Your sorrow will turn into joy, verse 21. And then he kind of gives it a, a description here. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, yes, I know, ladies. Some of you remember. <laughs> I know, I've had that conversation with a few ladies. Well, I remember, I remember the anguish, but in comparison to the joy, I know that might be debatable too, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Your kids are an incredible joy and a gift from God. So also you have sorrow now, verse 22, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask what? What does it say in your Bible. You will ask nothing of me. In the throes of sorrow, it's hard to have an active prayer life. And Jesus is acknowledging this. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in, of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He's, he's encouraging them. Even though you can't, it's hard. I get it. But try to keep connected with God. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Let's pray. God, thank you for your words. Speak to us powerfully now. Change us. Change our hearts. Convict us. Encourage us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Your outline uh, notes are in your bulletin. You can fill in the blank. Number one is history's defining moment. Resurrection. Resurrection. A little while, Jesus said, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, you will see me. The disciples didn't understand that the arrest of Jesus was only an hour or two away from this particular moment. And then his crucifixion would follow. Yet because 
He must go to the Father. Uh, You would see him again because he is going to rise again from the dead. A little while was three days. A little while after he was crucified, the tomb was empty. A little while. The first people to notice it empty were mighty men, right? No. It was mighty women. It was his followers who were female who found the empty tomb the first. And that's evidence, that's weighty evidence for the fact that no man came up with this book called the Bible. Because if man wrote it, they wouldn't have written that into the story because at that time, women did not mean much in terms of value. They didn't have a say. Their testimony in court was not valid. They could not be a witness. They were seen more as possessions than as people. And yet written in God's word is that women found that tomb empty. And they ran and they told the mighty men. And you know what the mighty men said to them? You're crazy. (laughs) You're out of your mind. I don't believe you. See, the disciples, the, the men who were following Jesus, even though Jesus told them about the resurrection... They weren't sitting down with a stop shot, stopwatch, you know, three, two, one, and fireworks and resurrection and pomp and circumstance and a parade. That's not what happened. They thought it was permanent. They thought their friend Jesus, their leader, their teacher, their master was permanent, permanently gone. But then Jesus appeared to his disciples after he rose again, and he appeared to hundreds of eyewitnesses. Jesus appeared before his brother James. Imagine that conversation. What would it take for your sibling to convince you that they are the son of God? Imagine that conversation. See, Jesus appeared before his brother James, and that powerful moment between brothers caused James to go from skeptic to believing his half-brother was the son of God. I encourage you to check out those scripture verses I put in your outline. Uh, It's fascinating. Now, verse 19 in our passage, it says that Jesus knew that they desired to ask him uh, about the resurrection. Jesus understood that the disciples wanted more clarity on the details, but he also needed that uh, more than information, they needed affirmation, they needed encouragement. They needed their hearts and their minds prepared for what's coming down the road emotionally. So instead of giving them more details about the resurrection, he gave them the gift of perspective. He gave them a warning. In advance of the sorrow, he said, this sorrow train is coming down the tracks at full board, and you cannot stop it. He told them not to be surprised by their sorrow to come. And we should not be surprised when sorrow comes our way. Why do you expect to live a life without sorrow? Why do you expect it? Sorrow hurts. Sorrow is not fun. But if you don't think you deserve sorrow, then you may end up bitter instead of better as a result of going through sorrow. Why do you deserve to live a sorrow-free life? You might think, I don't deserve this. I deserve better. Why me? Why me? Why now? Why this? Have you ever asked that question to yourself? Have you ever asked that question for somebody else? Why them? Why are they having to go through this? It doesn't make sense. Jesus is setting up the disciples with this wisdom so they can hang on to the hope while they walk through the valley of the shadow of death as they are about to see their friend, their teacher, their rabbi, to see Jesus arrested and murdered, strung up on a Roman cross because they're about to ask those questions. Why Jesus? What did he do? He didn't deserve that. Number two, sorrow turned to joy. Sorrow turned to joy. Verse 20, you will be sorrowful, Jesus said, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus knew that they would be plunged into deep and dark sorrow in the next literal few hours after this conversation. See, sorrowful at the loss of relationship with Jesus. They're going to be sorrowful at the humiliation of their master, of their leader, of the one who came from God, the anointed one. They are going to be sorrowful at the seeming victory of Jesus' enemies. 
They're going to be sorrowful because all they hoped for, all that they lived for for the past three years was going to be wiped away in a moment as he's arrested, as he's crucified. And Jesus knew that God would, by his power and grace, turn their sorrow into joy. God's work, listen to this, this is powerful. God's work was not to replace their sorrow with joy. Not to replace sorrow with joy, but to turn sorrow into joy. To take sorrow and turn it into joy, as he often does in our lives. So don't be surprised by sorrow. Don't be surprised by the joy that can follow sorrow. Sorrow would be directly connected to their coming joy, even as the sorrow of a woman going through labor pains, and those labor pains are directly connected to her joy as she welcomes a new human into the world. There's a connection with your sorrow and joy. How is your joy today connected with your past sorrow? If you think about some of the biggest moments of sorrow that you have gone through in your life, how is that connected to your joy today? I had a sorrow to joy moment hit me um, big time last night and and didn't even realize it hit me until I I was reflecting, but I had a... just an emotional moment when I put my uh, three-year-old Jude to bed and uh, we had been swimming in our, our little above-ground pool in the backyard and he came out and his hair was just, poof, it was all over the place and curly and a mess and I put him to bed and then when I went in to, to check on him, he was out, he was sleeping and, and I glanced at him and it hit me like a ton of bricks. He totally looked like my younger brother and my younger brother passed away when he was 11 and it just hit me and and. and yeah, it was a mixture of sorrow and joy. But, but I, I, I was in a joy-filled moment more, joyful for the gift of my own children and joyful for the gift of the 11 years that I had with my brother. See, God changes sorrow into joy when we trust him, when we have the right perspective, when we believe in him. And sometimes we have to say, Lord, help me in my unbelief. I get that. Sometimes you can't pray in your sorrow. I get that. So how is your joy today connected to past sorrow? I bet there are things in your life today that you run a pretty high joy baseline because of what you went through in your past. The joy and appreciation you have surrounding, for example, your health today might be really high compared to the average person because of the health challenge and sorrow that you had in your past. That's powerful. See, God doesn't replace sorrow, but he turns sorrow. He doesn't replace it. He turns it. Your joy is connected to past and current sorrow. Your sorrow today will be connected to future joy. You can trust that God will turn your sorrow to joy. You never know how high you are if you don't know how low you started. How many of you have ever uh, gone hiking? You enjoy hiking? Okay, uh, when you go hiking, what do you do? You're looking at the trail in front of you, and you're going up the mountain, you're going up the hill, what have you, and you're putting one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, but you don't realize how much work and, and what you've accomplished until you what? Until you stop, and you turn around, and you get perspective. I was on Half Dome last August, and we're going up this thing, and it was brutal, but I didn't realize how dramatic and how high and and how incredible the journey was until I stopped and I just was still and I looked and I surveyed and I'm like, oh my goodness, look at the valley way down there. What an incredible journey this has been, even though it's been hard and sweaty and um, just a tough, tough job to get up the mountain. But God calls you sometimes to be still. Be still and know him. And get a God perspective of your past, of your sorrow, and look up and see what he does with your heart in that moment. I like what Spurgeon said about our passage. He said, it is most remarkable and instructive that the apostles do not appear in their messages or or their letters, their epistles, uh, later on in scripture, to have spoken of the death of our Lord with any kind of regret. Isn't that interesting? Spurgeon goes on to say, the Gospels mention their distress during the actual occurrence of the crucifixion, but after the resurrection, and especially after Pentecost, we hear of no such grief. They were walking in the joy of Christ because of the sorrow 
that they went through. Jesus said himself later on in verse 33 in chapter 16, he said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So lift your head. It's not over yet. If you got breath in your lungs, rest in the joy of Christ and keep moving and engaging in what Christ has for you in this life. Number three is tenured joy. Tenured joy. Verse 22, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. No one will take your joy from you. Everybody say no one. That's an important point. Turn to your neighbor and say, not even you. They will not take your joy from you. No matter what you're going through, no matter how frustrating they can be. And you know what? Some of the closest people to us can be the most frustrating joy stealers. But guess what? They're not the ones stealing your joy because they can't. No matter if you're planning a wedding or a memorial, they cannot steal your joy. Amen? In September 1942, there's a guy named Viktor Frankl. Him and his wife and his parents were deported to a Nazi concentration camp in 1942. He was moved to a few uh, concentration camps at this time, including Auschwitz, the, the, the one that most people have heard of, and, and before being liberated by American soldiers in April 1945. So for three years, he was in these death camps, these, these concentration camps. And during this time, he lost his parents, he lost his brother, he lost his wife. And following the release uh, Frankl, he, he was a psychologist, and he wrote and he lectured on one's approach to mental and psychological healing. He believed that people are primarily driven by a striving to find meaning in one's life, and that it is this sense of meaning that enables people to overcome painful experiences. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he wrote about the concentration camps and how one survives. He concluded that even in the most absurd, painful, and dehumanized situation, life has potential meaning. And he knew it. I mean, he was in these camps, and there were some people just as strong as him who faded away, and they, they just died even without being executed they just faded away and died because they had no meaning in their heart and in their mind and therefore frankl says even suffering is meaningful here's a few powerful quotes from frankl i want to share with you look at the screen he says those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how isn't that amazing i think that's absolutely Powerful, And that's what Jesus is getting across to his disciples. You have meaning to live even when life seems meaningless, even when life seems chaotic, even when you're going through the throes of the valley of the shadow of death. Frankel also said this powerful statement. He said, what is to give light must endure burning. That's two words there, by the way, must endure burning. I think that's powerful. And Jesus calls us to be what? Salt and light in the world. And in order to be a light, there's going to be some burning. And you know what that's called? That's called your testimony. He said, Jesus brought you through the times of burning, and you praised him, and he got you through. You've heard these in baptism testimonies over and over. That's how God's going to use you. See, everyone wants to be a servant of Christ, but no one wants to be treated like a servant. And when you are, that's called burning. Are you willing to burn and to go through times of trial and tribulation for Christ? Uh, Victor Frankl, he also said this, final quote I want to share with you. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. In the midst of Auschwitz, you could look to that Nazi guard who's there to not do anything nice to you, and you can find meaning in an interaction even with your enemy. You can love somebody who should be unlovable. 
See, Frankel was a man acquainted with sorrow, yet he carried tenured joy, and Christ is inviting his followers to do the same. Carry the constant joy found in the fact that God will never stop loving his children. What kind of love? It's a wonderful, never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Amen? God never stops loving you, and that's the love found in the resurrection. And you can carry the joy of Easter with you every day. Don't just carry it on Easter. I mean, wear your Easter dress on a day that's not Easter because there's joy because of the resurrection every day. Amen? Come on. Now, and for believers, this joy can never be taken from you no matter what happens in life or even because of the limitation of life. For example, just the journey of aging can be full of sorrow. Are you with me? Did you know that the older people get, the more likely they are to have conversations about their latest aches and pains and surgeries and prescriptions? Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> if you are alive one day soon, that will be you too. Youth is fleeting. You will spend most of your life not young. Congratulations. <laughs> And our culture can place such a high value on youth and external beauty of youth that it can be a crisis in our culture to wake up one day and realize that you are no longer young. So how many, I'm going to ask this, Jerry told you, I was going to ask you, how many of you think, in your opinion, you're old? Put up your hand. Come on, just be honest. Put up your hand. If you think, in your opinion, you are old. Okay, and some of you aren't putting up your hand just because you don't put up your hand for anything. I get that, and you're welcome to not put up your hand. I, I understand that. Leave me hanging. Um, but uh, do you remember the point where you crossed the line? Was it a birthday? Was it an age? Was it, was it a circumstance? Was it an ache? Was it a pain? When, when did you cross the line in your own mind and heart that I'm young? Dang, <laughs> now I'm old. Ah, this is heavier now. Everything's heavier. Oh, I'm old. I remember taking surveys, and you remember these surveys. You still take them. And there's categories of age, you know, are you 16 to 25, are you 25 to 35, are you 35 to 50? And when I would go into a new category, I'd be like, no! It was so sobering. I'm, I'm in that category now. I'm moving farther to the right. Reality check. Most of your life will be spent on the right. <laughs> You will be in the right categories longer than the left, and you will be carrying the weight of the limitations of life. Don't you feel great? Congratulations. Oh, that's heavy. I'm getting old. So getting old, it's not for the faint of heart. Would you agree with that? If you're old, say amen. Amen. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart, but praise God that the season of being elderly, the season of being elderly, which we'll all go through, is temporary. Isn't that awesome? You all get a new model. <laughs> you all get to, to trade it in. You all get a new model when you get to heaven. You will get new bodies. Look what uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. How many of you feel better when you get new clothing, when you go shopping to the mall and you come home and you're like, you put on this new shirt and you look in the mirror and you're like, hey, you're looking good. How you doing? <laughs> come on, I know you've done it and you just feel great in that new piece of clothing. Well, imagine how much more you're going to feel when you put on a new body. It's going to be awesome. You get to trade it in for a better model. Now, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. Let me try that again. Now, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. Oh, you guys, come on. I've heard you whine louder than that. Let's try that again. Really loud. Come on. You've got to be my soundtrack. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. That's better. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies. 
so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by, this is beautiful, swallowed up by life, eternal life, with eternal joy in this new model body. See, joy is a surety, but your joy is connected to your sorrow. How much better heaven is going to be when you go through elderly. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. There were 12 young members of a youth soccer team and their assistant coaches, 25 years old. They wanted to go have a joy-filled experience, so they went into a cave to carve their names on the side of the cave wall. And you've been living in a cave if you haven't heard this story in the news over the last few weeks. It was a, a, a young boy's soccer team. And on June 23rd, after a practice match, they went into the cave, and then it rained like crazy. And the cave flooded in many parts. They could not get out. The world saw this over and over over the last few weeks, watching this 18-day drama unfold with this soccer team named the Wild Boars. And they were stuck nearly three miles into the cave. All these young boys, I think between what, 11 and 16 or 17, just young teenagers and, and tweens. And how scary. As a parent, for, for me personally, it was gut-wrenching to watch this, especially at first, because they didn't know if they were alive or dead. They had no clue, no contact with them. They just knew they were in there. And I think a park a warden saw their bikes or something tied up outside the cave. And that's how they found out they were, they were in there. Nobody knew whether they were dead or alive. And, 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 and there was sorrow, obviously, with them in this pitch black, dark cave. They're flooded. They find some uh, dry land within the cave, but they're stuck. Cannot see, cannot eat anything. Thank God that he provided water dripping from the roof of the cave for them to consume and drink. Now, when they were escaping, and part of the rescue plan is that they had to swim. They had to swim 0.62 of a mile. Have you ever swam a half a mile in a pool? That's not easy. And they're swimming 0.62 of a mile, scuba diving, and they don't know how to swim, and they've never scuba dived, and the water is the consistency of coffee. You cannot see anything. You are swimming completely blind for over half a mile in this murky water. And one of the rescuers, Saman Kunan, 38-year-old former Navy SEAL, he lost his life, if you remember that. His oxygen ran out for whatever reason. It was, it was really tragic when he was part of the rescue operation and tons of sorrow around this. And they were finally located July 2nd. So they were lost June 23rd. Nobody knew anything if they were dead or alive. They were finally located July 22nd, and then they were rescued July 9th and 10th. Incredible. See, sorrow was followed with action. Sorrow of losing these boys, not knowing if they're dead or alive, it was followed with action after action, working to overcome and compensate for what caused the sorrow. Sorrow followed by action leads to focus, fulfillment, and later joy. I want to encourage you, stay engaged in your sorrow. Stay engaged in your sorrow. Jesus never gave up in his sorrow. He never gave up in his agony. He allowed the mission to remain greater than the sacrifice of sorrow and agony. And every parent understands this. It's a hero mom or a hero dad that gives up so much of their personal preferences to give their child the best chance at a healthy home and safe life. Most parents are, are transformed when they have a child. You see, in an unexpected way, a parent is caught off guard with how deep of a well of tenacity they can find within themselves to consistency, to consistently do what needs to be done for their child, forsaking themselves, forsaking fun for themselves, to, to determine to press ahead to serve and protect and provide for their child. It's incredible. You have it within you. Determination is pressing ahead in the sorrow. Jesus is telling his disciples in this passage, press ahead despite the sorrow that has come in your way and press on with the tenacity that it takes, for example, to celebrate the rescuing of a soccer team, to celebrate the, the joy of a new human coming after nine months of pregnancy and, and tough 
painful, sorrow-filled labor to celebrate after not seeing your master for three days, thinking he's dead permanently, and then some ladies knocking on your door saying, hey, the tomb is empty. Oh, my goodness. And then meeting the resurrected Christ face to face. Jesus said, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to, what did he say? To joy, to joy. Some of you need to memorize that verse this week. Let it sink deep down in your heart and your mind. John 16, 20, it's your verse. Write it on a three by five card. Carry that with you. Don't just rely on your phone because you can turn your phone off. Carry a three by five card, put it in your pocket, put it on your dash. As you're driving around, you can glance at it. Be reminded that Jesus, he's not gonna replace your sorrow, but he's going to turn your sorrow into joy. And here's an indicator that you're putting your sorrow above your Savior, your prayer life, your prayer life. When it's hard to pray, Jesus says, come, come and ask me. I know it's hard to pray. He understands that. But then he tells his disciples, pray, pray. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. But then he says, when you ask my father for something in my name, he'll give it to you. And in the midst of sorrow, what, do you, what is your ultimate prayer? It's for peace. It's for the peace that passes all understanding. So you can drop those weight, weighty bricks in your life and experience that peace. So my question for you, are you staying engaged in your sorrow? Are you staying engaged with Jesus and the mission that he is giving you, even in the midst of your sorrow? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you, God, that we can come to you and say, help me in my unbelief, in the throes of anguish and lament and pain and the weight of sorrow in our lives. And Lord, I pray for those who do not have a relationship with you, that they can come to you, that they can find the hope and the peace even amidst tough circumstances. And they can come to you as simple as ABC, admit they're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And C, choose to follow Christ as their Lord and Savior. God, thank you for going to the cross for us. Thank you that you saw the joy of having a relationship with us as you went through this sorrow on the cross. God, we don't deserve it, but you gave it to us. And so, Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to trade those sorrows into joy and to praise you, and even when we don't feel like it, to continue to engage you and the mission you've given us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.